The NYU Abu Dhabi Art Gallery is an intimate museum space in a university setting. At the Art Gallery, we present curated exhibitions of art and culture of local relevance and international significance. We also invite you to explore our exhibitions in the project space and around campus, as well as our activities both online and in our reading room. The reading room located next to the Art Gallery. It's a space all communities can utilize and learn more about a wide variety of different topics. The project space is the NYAD Art Gallery's auxiliary venue to nurture young emerging artists and curators. We support a number of other art projects and activities beyond our exhibition spaces. We care for the permanent art installations on campus like Hassan Sharif's Copper Wire, which welcomes guests to NYUAD. We aim to create an atmosphere where everyone feels encouraged to share their thoughts and experiences. We hope that you will visit us online and in person to discover our exhibitions, events, and publications. We look forward to welcoming you. Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening at our Off the Stage series presented by Mubadala. My name is Reem Saleh, and I'm the Associate Director for External Relations and Partnerships at the Art Center. This evening's artist talk, Finding a Voice Between Tradition and Contemporary, is presented in partnership with NYUAD Career Development Center, and it is part of Off the Stage, which also includes community dinners, visits to NYUAD classes, post-show Q&As, and career chats. Artists in residence are involved in various Off the Stage events, and the best way to hear about them is through our newsletter or by checking the Off the Stage tab on our website. I want to thank and welcome our panelists, ethnomusicologist, composer, and founder of Boom Diwan, Ghazi Lemlefi, Syrian clarinet player and composer, Kinan Azmi, Emirati mixed media artist, Afral Dahiri, along with Algerian singer and leader of Lemma, Suad Asla. So Ad will be speaking in French and I will be typing the translation in the chat. This art chat will be moderated by filmmaker, screenwriter, and visiting associate professor of film and heritage studies at NYU Abu Dhabi, Alia Yunis. We will have a Q&A session with the panel at the end of the conversation. So please feel free to post your questions in the chat. Artists talk are recorded for social media and internal archiving purposes. I will now hand over to Alia to get the conversation started. Thank you, Reem, and welcome everybody. Um, I guess we're gonna get started right away with the uh, main theme of the conversation, um, which is uh, your link between music and heritage and art, because all of you um, could have chosen to frame your work um, through many different lenses, but you heritage part uh, is part of that framework or in the case of some of you the main framework and so of all the paths through music why did why did heritage play into that role and let's see who shall we start with um uh so had assalamu alaikum hi everybody uh Le lien entre la musique et, et l'héritage. Euh, moi, j'ai eu ce, ce, cet héritage depuis ma petite enfance, depuis que j'ai eu toute petite. J'ai eu un héritage musical par, par ma famille, par ma région, qui est une région qui est, où la musique fait partie, fait, fait partie de nous. 
et euh, c'est ça qui m'a qui m'a emmené après à, 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 à aimer ma musique et euh, désolée j'ai pas bien compris la question je suis un peu Uh, how did you decide to start uh, pursuing this uh, this music as your as as your passion? Alia, tu m'écoutes? Oui, oui, j'attends, oh. j'attends juste comment tu as décidé de poursuivre cette musique. Uh, um, why did you choose this path um, for your music? What attracted you to working with these women? D'accord. Alors moi, j'ai grandi, j'ai grandi dans une ville du sud algérien qui s'appelle Béchar, où la musique fait partie de notre vie. Quand on est triste, on chante. Quand on est heureux, on chante. Elle fait vraiment partie de notre vie. Mais les femmes n'ont pas le droit de 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 d'être sur scène. Cette musique, euh, on pratiquait la musique en intimité entre 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 femmes. Et après, je suis partie jeune en France. Euh, ma, ma, ma première rencontre, euh, j'ai rencontré une femme qui s'appelle Asnal Bacharia. Euh, Asnal Bacharia, c'est une artiste algérienne qui fait de la musique traditionnelle Gnawa, la musique d'esclaves. Elle est venue en France, je suis allée la voir en concert et là c'est comme si j'étais voir mon, mon pays qui est venu à, à Paris parce que euh, les chants de, de, de Asna Bacharia me rappelaient beaucoup mon enfance. Et c'est là où Asna m'a proposé de travailler avec elle. Au départ, j'ai hésité parce que je connaissais la, tout, tous les chansons, mais je ne me voyais pas chanter ce, ce, ce genre de, de chansons. Après, en réfléchissant, je me suis dit pourquoi pas. On a fait beaucoup de tournées ensemble, j'ai énormément travaillé avec elle. Et après, j'ai décidé de composer mes propres morceaux qui sont, euh, de, qui sont de moi. Je m'inspire de, de la tradition, mais j'ai composé mes propres morceaux où j'ai fait mon album solo qui s'appelle Jawel. Des années après, j'ai réalisé mon rêve de petite fille, c'est-à-dire euh, voir des femmes que je voyais étant enfant, que j'allais voir avec ma maman dans les mariages. Et cette musique me faisait énormément de, de bien, même, même en vivant en exil, quand j'étais malheureuse, j'écoutais cette musique et, et ça me faisait du bien. Et j'avais vraiment, vraiment envie de montrer au monde entier euh, la... la, la l'importance de, de, de cette musique parce que c'est une musique qui fait du bien à l'âme euh, pour moi c'est une musique qui guérit aussi et j'avais envie que le monde entier découvre ces femmes qui sont dans l'ombre et euh, c'est pour ça que j'ai monté ce groupe qui, que j'ai appelé le main le main ça veut dire l'union le, le, le rassemblement voilà beautiful thank you um... Afra, you work in art uh, in, and work with modern art. Can you talk a little bit about how um, the, it, you're trying to understand the past in the UAE is, is, and your heritage plays into your art? Yeah, so I think in my practice, I mean, I grew up in, in uh, Abu Dhabi and in my younger years, I grew up between Abu Dhabi and Al Ain, where uh, most of my family are originally from. And Growing up in those two cities, Al Ain was very uh, calm, um, very nicely like spread out, uh, not many high rises and such. And on the contrary, uh, coming back to the city where I went to school, uh, surrounded constantly by construction, uh, construction almost became like this timeline for my practice, a, a, a suggestion for change. Uh, and development and change in development that really affected, um, I think, us in, on different levels of like culturally, religiously, um, sociopolitically, uh, in so many areas. But in, in a lot of uh, moments, I think that heritage or tradition comes into my work uh, through a lens of looking back at my upbringing and many of the social conditioning that existed within my environment and kind of reflecting on it. So I started my practice looking at change and how do we process change at such a fast pace? I mean, we're growing, uh, if we look particularly at the art scene, we're as artists growing just at, 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 parallel to the art scene 
growing and becoming what it is to be. And so just looking, for example, at that, uh, I've realized that I needed to slow down time and I needed to kind of sensitize, take time to like process things for longer moments. I've realized that our memory became much shorter um, and the span that we remember at is also much shorter. And so I became more conscious and I started looking back at more like habitual practices that were present in the household um, or uh, engaging in longer processes of uh, art making to be able to slow down time and kind of like process the change as it happens. Yeah, it's remarkable. Um, Razi, um, also your, your, yours is very clearly linked to heritage and I would like you to talk about how you developed um, the, the, um, the pearl music and the trade routes um, in following that. Great, thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Um, so um, I think my, my work really takes a, a critical approach towards heritage and how it's represented um, as a national discourse. Um, and the tensions between that and the lived experience, the traditions of which this music, Kuwaiti Bahri music, Kuwaiti music of the sea was born. Um, as, you know, as an heir to this tradition, as somebody who's linked to this tradition, like so many uh, people in Kuwait and in the greater Gulf region who had ancestry connected to the sea, um, it became kind of a, a, a personal um, project for me. And, um, and something I'm very much uh, uh, academically invested in, but also very much, um, I think also kind of emotionally invested in this work. And so when I see um, expressions of heritage that aren't aligned with the lived practice, the historical practice of this music and what occasioned it, right? The, namely uh, trade within the context of the uh, Indian Ocean, certainly the Western Indian Ocean, that the music of the seafaring people of Kuwait has imprints of Northeast African Swahili culture, South Asian culture that go beyond um, influence. And to categorize it as an influence is, uh, is just simply um, wrong. It's part of this dialogue and this kind of exchange. And so, um, and so I started to trace how this heritage was being represented. I went on government sponsored pearl diving trips where uh, we would spend uh, a week out at sea pearl diving with uh, old shipmasters and uh, the remaining nochadas, uh, the captains. And, um, and I met some people during that trip, this one particular trip that became members of Boom Diwan. And I saw that they were practicing the music in their homes in much different ways that they, it was being represented on stage. And in my, uh, uh, in, in my research with them and in my ethnographic work with them, uh, the line between practitioner and scholar uh, were not only blurred, but they were just kind of in a symbiotic kind of loop. And so um, for me, Boom Diwan was established for the purpose of reviving a tradition of dialogue and exchange where the aesthetic has really uh, a kind of freedom that is not afforded to national expressions and discourse. So it's kind of, uh, in the words of Arturo O'Farrell, it's kind of, it's kind of an, an artivistic, artivism project for me um, that happens to also be academically situated. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, we're gonna let uh, can I, um you uh, you uh, are involved in various genres of music, jazz, classical, and of course your Syrian background and Arabic music. Um, what? How did the? How did your your growing up in Syria and your heritage influence the musical choices you've made? Uh, <clears throat> hello to everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because my background <clears throat> is not what people expect as somebody who worked in Syria. I studied when I was a little child, studied the clarinet. Uh, most of my education was uh, the Western classical uh, repertoire. Uh, you know, I grew up playing Mozart, Beethoven and Brahms. And I, you know, as a little child, 
for me, uh, I didn't know if th this music was local or not. You know, it didn't matter. For me, it was music that I connected with. And I had a, like two strong influences at home. My dad is a Western classical music uh, lover. My mom is a traditional Arabic music uh, fan. So I grew up listening to both. But uh, the, what was available in terms of pedagogy back in Damascus, uh, there was the Arab Conservatory of Music, which was later in, uh, renamed uh, as Surh al Wadi's Conservatory of Music. The main education was Western classical music. And so that's what I, what I did. And I think throughout my life, I mean, I'm trying to, to summarize it as much as I could. Maybe I was trying to run away from heritage, you know, because I was growing up in, a, in somebody else's heritage, in a way, even though without knowing it. So I wanted to be able to, when I play, you know, a Mozart concerto in, I don't know, in Europe, uh, I wanted to assimilate as much as possible. I wanted to become the Austrian or the German or the French, depending on the composer I'm, I'm, uh, I'm playing for. <clears throat> And I think my uh, love for Arabic music uh, arrived later on to the mix. I moved to New York about 21 years ago and uh, to pursue my graduate studies. Uh, so lots of the jazz influences came uh, to the music I was writing because, you know, I'm surrounded by jazz musicians and I, I'm, I'm a collaborator by nature. And I think Arabic music, I started to have real interest, though we studied Arabic music at the Higher Conservatory of Music in Damascus, but it was only like two courses kind of electives, it wasn't, the focus wasn't there. And also my intellectual focus was not in that when I was, you know, 19 years old. But uh, I discovered, you know, I think it's a classic case when you discover the museum of your hometown only after you leave that hometown. And most of the time it happens when you have visitors coming over and then, oh, let's go to the museum for the first time, you know, me and the, the strangers who are visiting. Uh, so I decided to just collaborate with people who knew uh, very much. And I started a band called Hiwar with uh, a wonderful oud player, Isam Rafair, who used to be the head of the Arabic music department at the Higher Conservatory of Music. So that was a gate through which I entered that world. Of course, by no means do I consider myself an expert on Arabic music. Uh, I like to define the music I, I write, whether I play it or I, I compose it, uh, as music that is inspired by a multitude of traditions without being limited by any of these traditions. I'm, I'm more interested, at least now, in what the contemporary, uh, you know, music scene in the Arab world. Uh, and, you know, this interest also led me to see how heritage influenced the works of other composers. My, my doctor dissertation was about identity uh, found in contemporary uh, like music works written for the clarinet in the last 20 years. Works by Karim Rustom, Zaid Jabri, Dia Sikkari, uh, a bunch of names. And, uh, and, and, and you see the obsession uh, of heritage in these works. Maybe they're not on the surface, uh, but you see how like, you know, Makam development uh, really, you know, knitted very nicely within the orchestration. And, uh, and I do think, you know, heritage like everything else uh, evolves with time. And I'm, uh, I don't wanna have the, uh, it's not enough, at least. It's not enough to put the heritage in a museum where we just frame it and, and lock it. For me, I like to experiment. I think experimentation, uh, there's no taboos in experimentation, I think. As long as, of course, as you respect and you give credit to the source, that goes without saying. Uh, but that's where I am right now. I'm still learning uh, about my own heritage, in a way, because, you know, if you think of Syria, Syria is a melting pot for many traditions. Uh, many of them were really... Uh, didn't get the chance to get on stage for, for many, many years. Uh, and I think what's happening in Syria in the, in the last 10 years, uh, I guess my curiosity grew, but also I see lots of artwork coming from Syrians within Syria, but also Syrians uh, elsewhere. So you see all the, you know, Armenian music, Kurdish music, uh, ancient Syriac music is all going to the surface. And I'm, uh, so I'm learning a lot uh, during this period. And could that be that it's all coming to the surface as a result of, of the situation in Syria, that there's a, a clinging to or a, a, an interest in reviving what seems to have, is that risk I, of being lost? I, I, think, I think it's a combination. I, yeah, certainly what you said is true. Maybe part of why I was not, you know, you know so some of the panelists would say, you know, you have to rescue something. When I growing up in Syria, I didn't feel that need because there were so many people who were working on, uh, you know, ancient music of Aleppo, or uh, the, the, the tradition was so, so alive. 
Of course, in the last 10 years, I know for a fact that so many traditions disappeared or at least relocated. It, well, in the best case scenario, maybe relocated, but uh, so certainly there are things that are lost. Maybe that triggered my interest. But you know, for, for me, making music as the basis is not, um, you know, there's always a cause behind it. You know, we have different causes in life, but pleasure is a very important notion of why I do the music I write. Uh, I like always to think that I write what I like to hear. So, but also part of contributing to a nation that is going through tragedy in the last 10 years is to pay attention to what this, this place or this piece of land has to offer before it disappears forever. So, and it's hard to know, but also I think lots of the attention from the outside world too uh, came suddenly to Syria in the last 10 years. You know, 10 years ago when I play a concert in the middle of the US, nobody knew where Syria was. Now they know where Syria, Syria is, but they have a very specific uh, expectation of what a Syrian artist should present, you know? And I'm also in my work, I'm trying to break free from that too. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, still, it's still evolving, but I do know that what Syria presented in the last 10 years, we we're seeing uh, a lot and lots of it is really good. And lots of it is a great effort to preserve a tradition that is, that is lost. I think you're addressing the issue of rescue. It comes across in all of, you, in all of your work that there's an element of that. And there's also the issue of the audience. So the audience um, is, uh, for a lot of you is not, is not necessarily the, um, the, the community you come from. So I was wondering um, if we could talk a little bit about how the people whose music you're working on, how they, how they respond to it. And I think if I were to ask Sarad, it would be, you know, you've worked with these women, um, you've brought them to the surface in France and, and, and internationally. Um, how has it changed them at home? Um, has, it, uh, has it given them some, some more, um, no, I don't want to say power, but more recognition um, and interest in, in their music at home. Tout à fait. Euh, comme je vous disais, les femmes, elles sont, elles sont 12, le mât se compose de, de 12 femmes, et c'est toutes des, héritier, des héritières de, de, de musique traditionnelle, soit de la percussion, soit des chants, tout, euh, toute, euh, chacune a une spécialité. Il y a une qui fait Hajazaza, qui a 79 ans, qui est spécialiste dans le Hadra, qui a animé pendant 30 ans tous les deuils de, 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 de mon village. Il y a Aziza, qui est une grande, grande percussionniste. Et, euh, et, et ces femmes, elles pratiquaient depuis leur enfance cette musique sans, sans savoir qu'elles ont de l'or entre, euh, entre les mains. Nous, on a un vrai, un vrai problème d'identité chez nous. Et, euh, et, et cette musique, elle est vraiment en voie de disparition. Nous, on a, moi, j'habite dans une ville frontalière euh, du Maroc. Du coup, on est juste à côté, là, juste à côté du Maroc. Et on a, on, on a un patrimoine euh, commun. Il change un, un tout petit peu notre patrimoine, mais il y a un patrimoine commun. Et il y a eu beaucoup de... Euh, quand quand j'ai emmené ce groupe au Maroc pour chanter avec des Marocaines. Quand on commençait à chanter, les femmes, les Marocaines disaient « Non, ça, ça, ça nous appartient, c'est nos morceaux. » Et puis les Algériennes, nous, « Non, c'est à nous. » Il y avait vraiment cette, euh, ce, ce patrimoine qui est partagé. Après, petit à petit, on a commencé à faire des concerts en Algérie. Parce que déjà, en Algérie, on était méconnu du public euh, euh, du nord euh, d'Algérie. Euh, beaucoup de jeunes nous disaient qu'on ne savait pas qu'en Algérie, les femmes elles jouaient le karkabou, que les femmes jouaient la percussion, qu'on qu avait ce, ce style de musique. Euh, en Algérie, c'était très, très bien. Les, les gens, ils ont beaucoup, beaucoup adoré notre groupe. Après, on a, on a fait l'international. Et ce qui a changé vraiment, c'est au départ, comme je vous ai dit, avant, les femmes chantaient, mais les jeunes ne s'intéressaient pas. Les jeunes filles n'écoutaient pas ces, ces chants. Elles, le trouvaient, elles trouvaient que c'était vieux et que c'était pour les vieux. Toute cette tradition, elles n'en voulaient pas. Et le fait de monter ce groupe et, et, et au fait et, et, et que le public, et le, le peuple de Béchard euh, ont vu qu'on a qu'à l'étranger, on a eu beaucoup de succès un peu partout. Maintenant, les, 
les jeunes commencent vraiment, vraiment à s'intéresser à cette musique. Je n'arrête pas d'avoir des messages des jeunes filles qui me disent « Souad, intègre-nous dans ton, dans ton groupe, on veut, on, veut, on veut venir jouer avec vous ». Il y a quatre ou cinq groupes de jeunes filles qui, qui se sont constituées et qui chantent actuellement euh, à Béchard. Ça, ça a donné vraiment une force à ces femmes une force et une dignité. Maintenant, elle porte, elle porte ce, 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 cette tradition avec, euh, avec dignité et, et, et je suis très, très, très heureuse d'avoir participé juste un tout petit peu. Je sais qu'il y a beaucoup de, de travail à faire, mais à sauvegarder cette, cette tradition et surtout à la faire aimer à nos, à nos, à nos jeunes. Parce qu'ailleurs, elle est vraiment, cet art, il est vraiment aimé. Mais la faire aimer aux gens de, de, de chez nous, c'est très bien, je trouve. C'est vraiment really fantastique. Merci. Um, Afra, you work with contemporary modern art, um, which of course is not from, from the Gulf region and it is new. Um, how, how, do, how does your uh, own community, your own family, um, respond to your work um, do they uh, and understand what you're trying to do um. Um, that's an interesting question because <laughs> I think that um, I mean I went to school in the UAE for my undergraduate and then I moved to the states uh, for my MFA and I learned, I think, a lot of skills um, technically in production with glass, uh, ceramics when I was in the States. Um, and I kind of like my mediums and applications, I think, speak to a universal um, audience. But I was very much concerned at the same time that I wanted my community to understand my work. I wanted my work to become almost as if uh, a way for them to access and understand art, um, I had to also involve them and have them uh, have the work be relevant to them in a way. Um, I think that happened um, in the work first uh, that I presented in uh, Expo that uh, was the Pillow Fort Playground where I used um, the traditional tekias, um Uh, as a pillow fort, which is something, again, internationally understood, but I'm introducing it from my context of what it looked like through my childhood, and it's a collective memory. It's a, uh, I was asked for that project to, what would you want to monumentalize in our contemporary world um, uh, within Expo, and I felt like I wanted to monumentalize a memory that exists within the collective uh, of the society. And so I think that that work became closer to people and they were able to access it. I, I was getting a lot of messages from people saying, oh my God, that's like what we used to do. This is my memory or this is our childhood and such. And I think that's when the work became accessible. But then uh, my other work, my um, predominant research about Uh, materiality and recently been exploring uh, hair as a material, I think that in titling the work, uh, people uh, are almost being invited to um, unpack the work and deconstruct it, uh, have their own interpretations. Uh, one of the works that went uh, a bit viral last year was Tasriha which was my uh, rope installation. Um, and it's a hairdo in Arabic and something that people understood and started questioning, why did you call it tasriha? Or why, does, why is it called tasriha? And then followed a work called Fil Sha'ar, which um, was taken from a poem actually that's usually recited in um, more folklore music uh, in the UAE culture. Um, the the phrase means unravel the hair and it kind of, like in the way that it's sung um, it's usually it usually means unravel the hair and like uh, dance um, for the woman which is part of a traditional um, dance but then it does not make sense because I was also taught to hide my hair and uh, obscure um, and and 
put a boundary in that way. And so it kind of questions that, how do I sing the song, but I can't actually perform it. Fascinating. Um, uh, yeah, and actually I, that segues into uh, Hazi as well, this issue of language as well. So you, you, know, you had the official heritage narrative of the Kuwaiti government about the pearl music and everyone was familiar with it locally and the tourists. Um, but what, what did, what, how did it, when you said, shook it up a little bit and brought it back to the community in a different way, how, how was the response to that? Um, so the response was, uh, was uh, very mixed. Um, on one end, uh, we were, Boom Diwan is invited to play for, you know, youth festivals in front of thousands of locals in Kuwait and people uh, were very much engaged in listening to the music and uh, rhythmically and you know we sing in Arabic and for most of the in fact all of it's in Arabic um, so there was a kind of reaction of um, you know there's some fresh there's something fresh about what's happening something new that this music is is moving and kind of responding to Kina that it's not this frozen you know thing that only should be played in a certain way um, and then on the other end, you had people coming and saying, um, what gives you the right to take these sacred arts and play with them? And, um, and that, was, that was always an interesting uh, question to answer because um, while I'm the founder of uh, Boom Diwan, uh, I'm also a member of the Ma'yuf Mjelli Ensemble. And that is one of the oldest uh, pearl diving ensembles in Kuwait. So, so it's so it's it's easy for me to to respond to some of these people and say, well, we are also the we're also the preservers of the tradition and the ones pushing it forward. Um, and so, yeah, so so yeah, the short answer to your question is it's it's a mixed uh, it's a mixed bag. Um, what's really refreshing though is that. Um, that when we played it locally to, to to large audiences in Kuwait and many times sponsored by the government, that it has been quite relatable and um, and it also I think um, I hope uh, that it inspires the youth to say to see that there are that there are ways to be creative and and engaged in in the contemporary um, and that we have you know really beautiful really really a really beautiful uh, body of work that we can. That we can still play with and, and not be afraid to do so, but there is some resistance of of, of changing things a little too much. Um, I, I was going to follow up with that with the issue of language, and so the music is a fusion um, from from the from the trade route, and the people who were on the boats were not all Arabic speaking. So did that affect the 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 lyrics of those songs, and have and are they still understandable to Kuwaitis today? So um, some of the songs um, were sung, for example, in Swahili. Uh, and those have been, in the last 20 years, uh, um, sung, sung in Arabic. But in the traditional settings, in, the, in people's homes, they're still, uh, they're still sung in the different and non-Arabic languages. But there's the other part is that's really interesting is that there are artifacts in the music, historical artifacts that um, that exist today that are not Arabic, uh, that in fact are made up words that were made up through these exchanges and, 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 and uh, interactions with trade that no one can really uh, define. And they've never been quite uh, def definable. And there are varying theories onto what, what these words can mean. For example, uh, there's a genre of pearl diving music called Sengini that was, uh, that was supposedly brought to Kuwait in 1936 by a particular family from the Mid Hussein family. But the word, it's, argue, it's arguable that the word actually means sing because the British sailors would tell the Kuwaiti pearl seafarers, sea sing, sing. So they said Sengin, called it Sengini. So that's one thing. The other thing is there are some, um, perhaps some Christian influences on the music, which is also interesting. When they say sing the holo, 
uh, hola comes a lot and, and repeat it. And, and some scholars argue that this is, uh, this is a form of the word hallelujah, right? And so, um, so there, there isn't agreement. It's not even that there are uh, non-Arabic words in there, that there's not even an agreement on what they are, but there is a great value placed on cons in conserving them and preserving them. Um, so, I, I, and yeah, so that, for me, that's another way in which this music pushes back against a lot of these kind of reductive uh, narratives. Really interesting. Um, I, and uh, Kanan, I was going to ask you a question, but I can already see there's two questions related to this, and I'm going to get back to the opera later when we talk about what's next for everybody. But um, um, but so the question here, I'll read it. And your music is very influenced by Syrian culture. How do you navigate using your music and your culture in a way that is new and contemporary without completely straying from your roots? You know, it's it's hard to answer questions like that because because I do feel rooted in any tradition I spend time with. You know, I feel deeply rooted in the the German culture, if you want, because I know this repertoire very well. I feel rooted in uh, in the New York jazz scene because that's what I've been doing most of you know <laughs> the last uh, twenty years. Uh, I, I'm somebody who enjoys taking risk. Uh, when I'm doing art, and I, I do think art is an act of, you know, making art is an act of freedom. And uh, to do that, you, you, you have to be willing to take all the risks that you can, including being described as, oh, this person is totally in disconnect with his roots. You know, if, uh, I, I think, you know, when you write again, I try to make the channel between, you know, my heart, my brain and what's coming out as short as possible. And, uh, and the music, I write naturally is influenced by by everything I'm experiencing, you know. Um, uh, so, you know, it's it's funny because the way people describe my music has been, you know, when I play my music in in the Arab world, it's described as this, you know, it's a jazzy uh, Western influence. When I play my music in, in New York, I am the guy who's coming from the East, right? And in the meantime, I, I used to enjoy being the other all the time. You know, I wanted to be the Damascene in New York and the New Yorker in Damascus. Now I'm becoming more interested in being the Damascene in Damascus and the New Yorker in New York. I want to be more in touch with what's offered locally as much as possible. But, you know, like the whole idea of fruits and how is that represented in, a, in the contemporary setting is always open for so many interpretations. You have unlimited options. And, uh, and I think it goes work by work. You know, uh, I cannot, you know, paint all the works that I'm writing with the same brush. Some pieces are inspired by, you know, the Polish composer Penderecki. Some of them are like Philip Glass influence, and some of them are, are you know, are directly influenced by Sabah Fakhri. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I enjoy the multitudes. And I try to focus every time I'm doing something, I try to dig vertically as much as I could. I think all of us do that naturally in our lives. We spread horizontally as much as we can. When you are interested in something, that's when you start digging vertically. For for you to be to be honest, you know, at the end of the day, what is most important for me is that the art I'm making is honest. It has to please me first, obviously, but it also it has to be honest. And when um would and I'll come back to that question. <laughs> I'm gonna um I'm gonna go back to sad and um uh. I'm going to ask um, before we take in more questions from the audience of what you're thinking of all doing next, um, and if and if it is uh, and and what audience you're anticipating, or are you writing for yourself now, or are you working on something on commission? Um, if you could tell us what you're doing now. Alors mes projets euh, du futur. Euh, en ce moment, je suis en train de, de préparer mon mon album. Euh, qui va sortir l'année prochaine et euh, j'aimerais faire un deuxième album avec euh, avec les femmes mais cette fois-ci j'aimerais euh, aller enregistrer chez moi dans le désert pour être euh, mieux inspiré c'est euh, je pense que je continuerai toujours à faire euh, si je peux à faire des, des, des albums comme ce comme cela de le main c'est pas pour euh, pour sauvegarder ce, ce patrimoine. Malgré que moi, j'ai aussi ma, ma carrière, j'ai mes influences, euh, je compose ma propre musique qui n'a rien à voir, qui est 
inspiré par la tradition, mais qui n'a rien à voir avec la, la tradition. Mais je pense que c'est un devoir euh, de... C'est un, un devoir de faire un travail de mémoire, un travail de, 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 préser, de préservation de, du patrimoine immatéri immatériel de ma région. Et le projet, c'est de venir chanter chez vous aussi. C'est ce qu'on devait faire et ça ne s'est pas fait. Je tiens à dire, les femmes, elles sont vraiment très, très malheureuses parce qu'elles étaient très, très, très contentes de venir à Abu Dhabi et d'échanger avec d'autres musiciens. Mais j'espère que ce projet se, se réalisera et on viendra chanter chez vous. Inch'Allah. Afra, what's on the horizon for you? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm teaching uh, this semester and very much involved in, um, with the seniors. So. I have a big uh, batch of visual artists graduating this year um, and I'm mentoring them, 18 students. So uh, it's a bit of a commitment, um, but at the same time, I just moved into a new studio space. So I'm setting that up. It's also part of a dream that I had for so long to have um, a warehouse studio. So that's where I'm at. I'm setting that up, hoping that would be uh, a good space to work, but also a space to welcome other artists, um, young artists, students to actually exist and visit the space. Yeah, so that's where I'm at. Razi. Um, uh, um, it's, uh, it's difficult to say. I mean, um, obviously to continue to make music, um, you know, developing the modern Khaliji ensemble at NYU Abu Dhabi. And that's been a big, um, a big source of inspiration and a place where I'm putting a lot of my energy. Um, you know, and going back to the, the question of language a minute ago, I mean, the, the, I want to, I want to put this music in, into as much, you know, dialogue with whoever wants to to engage with us, you know, with Nduduzo Makatini, he was engaging his Kwazulu traditions in dialogue with the uh, with the Bahri music. So um, I guess I mean the the I, I want to have more conversations with uh, with other musicians and and to continue to collaborate. There there are some concerts on the horizon. I I, will, I can't say what they are now, but I'm very excited to get back into. I just want to play. I want to get back into playing music in front of people. That's uh, that's what I want. I would imagine all the musicians are feeling that now. Yeah. Um, Kenan, there was a question about the opera. So, and it's in your bio that we all have too. So, um, I'm taking it that's your prime project right now. And if you could talk a little bit about it. Yes, uh, it is. A, it's a project that I've been working on for the last uh, maybe six years. I think this connects somehow with, with heritage. One of the things that I missed paying attention to growing up was poetry. And, uh, you know, the Arab world is maybe poetry is the, the art form, uh, at least the most popular maybe art form. And, uh, and I never paid attention to lyrics, whether it's like songs by the Beatles or the Moshahat sung by Basawah Fari, never paid attention. Uh, ten, year, 10 years ago, I just started discovering the, the, the richness of, of the language itself, but also the poetry that uh, the Arab world has produced. So I've been reading a lot. And then I happen to be like the, uh, a lucky person because I have 15 friends who are poets. And so I, I asked them to send me everything they have published. And these are poets pretty much close to where I am in age, you know, minus plus 10 years. And through them, you know, uh, Afra mentioned, like talked beautifully about the collective memory. And I, when I was reading this, I'm talking about poets who wrote uh, poems in the last 10 years. And this idea came, came about is how beautiful it would be to, uh, to try to document the time of a country through the words of its poets. So the, the opera is titled Songs for Days to Come. There's a little bit of, uh, you know, some kind of hope, I guess, I guess in it, based on the uh, poems of 15 Syrian poets. Uh, unfortunately, all of them live abroad right now. Uh, the libretto is written, so basically we constructed a story based on, the, on these 15 poems. What these poems have in common, uh, the fact that they're written in the last 10 years, uh, 
uh, and all of them, I think, kind of show a shift in, in how Syrians speak. You know, there is so much courage in these poems that, that was truly inspiring, you know, whether it's discussing religion, discussing uh, government, discussing sexuality, you name it. It was really inspiring to, to see uh, what's, what's out there. So, uh, so the premiere is going to be in June. It's commissioned by this uh, uh, opera house in, in Osnabrück, Germany. And it's going to be sung basically all in Arabic. The dialogues will be kind of, uh, uh, I wanted to be, keep it flexible because I would like to bring it to as many parts of the world as possible. So the dialogue parts will be sung in the language where it's presented, which is going to be in German. But it's flexible so I can change that to another language. All the singing is going to be in Arabic. That's really cool. Um, and that's six years project. You said it's been six years you've been working on it. It's been, you know, I, I keep I keep touring as a, you know, as a soloist and I with my own jazz quartet and everything. But this has been what has been occupying my brain for the last, uh, maybe for the last 10 years. But it took me a few years to to realize how it's going to come out. It started as a song cycle for clarinet, cello, uh, piano and voice. But then I decided to to make it a bigger thing. So it became a full couple of two hours opera. Okay. Um, there's a question in the chat about um, generational collaborating with other generations. It's obvious for Sarah that that's the whole foundation of her work, but also I know for all of you and Razi a lot also. Um, and then do you have an intergenerational dialogue with art for Hafra? Um, I, um, let's see. Um, uh, Afra, do you want to try um, to talk about that at all? Um, I mean, I think that definitely, um, I mean, I speak to my students all the time about past and present, but then it's very interesting because I think that my generation, I was born in 88, so I've witnessed a chunk of the transition, but um, my students, many of them in their early 20s, had also witnessed a completely different shift. Um, so it's such a small span of time, but 10 years, 20 years difference makes a big difference. But I think someone who's, um, I've really, really enjoyed my conversations with and constantly like pushing my boundaries and challenging the conversations is with my mother. And um, my mom was born in 72. And so it was very interesting. She grew up in Al Ain. Um, so I always kind of uh, have these conversations with her when I'm producing a work or conducting a research for my work. I constantly go back to her and question, ask her how relevant it is or what does it mean to her particularly and such. Um, so it's been very uh, interesting to hear uh, from her generation, her perspective, although it's not very far away from mine, but they've still uh, had a big shift to what is happening today. Um, and some of these conversations like were really interesting in the way that I remember asking her last time we were traveling and I'm like, how do you feel with all the changes that are happening? Like specifically to like the cultural change changes, um, a lot of the do's and don'ts that we grew up with are shifting, um, the cityscape, the cosmopolitan uh, life introdu introduced in, in the way that it is today. Um, and she like took a moment of silence and she said, you know, I, I she's like, sometimes I'm confused. Like, I don't know um, what it is that was, um, actually right or not, or what it is that we were taught um, correctly or not. Uh, so there's an interesting kind of moment of influx where I think in her generation, there's a lot of questioning of what is happening, but then there's a generation that, that are here now, uh, and I reference my students, who or coming full force and owning the, the scene, the narrative, and uh, they're very opinionated, they're very um, well-spoken. And I think that's fantastic. 
but I think that there's also an interesting point where I think I stand it, where I try through the work to document these moments of transitions. Um, or at least attempt to document these moments uh, of transition and, and even if they were uh, biased. Yeah, and you are talking about such small generational gaps between your mother, you, and your students. And yet the differences are so huge. It's just amazing. Hazi, um, uh, I know that like, you also work with um, different generations. And, and um, how is that how has that dialogue been? Um, so before um, before we play a new composition, perform a new composition uh, in Boom Diwan, especially if we're engaging with something um, really spiritual and uh, and really traditional and something that is relatively private. Um, I'll always um, I'll always share with the elders and the diwaniya what I'm about to play, and it's not even not even for them to tell me <clears throat> whether or not I pushed a boundary too far uh, sonically or you know something on the surface, but uh, whether whether something's being narrated with the right kind of spirit. Um, so I, I definitely seek counsel from the elders and the divania to make sure that um, that the disposition of the of the music and how it's being performed um, is aligned spiritually in the right kind of way, um, and I, I really depend on them for for that guidance. Um, as far as with uh, you know the generations younger than myself, I mean, with the with especially with the modern Khaliji ensemble um, here at NYU, you know, um, and and some of my J term trips, I've it's it's been really uh, amazing to welcome lots of local women into these uh, music settings and have them um, participate in in, in this uh, in this music um, in a way um, that is not necessarily traditional. Uh, not only in the university setting where you could think, okay, this is like a, an obvious place for like, you know, free thinking and experimentation, uh, but also to take them to the traditional diwaniyas and have them also be welcome there. So uh, by definition, this, this musical genre, I mean, if you, if you ever uh, join me in Kuwait into a diwaniya, you'll see that there'll be people from, you know, who can barely walk until, you know, people in their 90s all, all kind of together. So I, I just think of, by definition, the music that I play is multi-engaged, is multi-generational. Speaks to all of them about the change similar to with, with Afra um, that's happening. Um, there's um, so there's just one more question that I think, uh, Sarah, that maybe you could address about social media, because um, I know you have a lot of uh, things on YouTube and how has, um, how, how has that uh, helped give access to your music? Um, you have a worldwide audience now because of social media um, and YouTube. And um, uh, how has that influenced your music at all? That's the question, if I'm reading it correctly. Yes. Yeah, how is the, um, I'm sorry, what, um, what I'll read it exactly. The instantaneous and worldwide access to shared music and visual art via the internet. What influence do you think this has, has on preserving traditions and the evolution of them, either your own or others? So has YouTube had any influence on you? Yeah. <laughs> Euh, je voulais euh, juste euh, reprendre la question, quel est le partage entre les, les générations. Euh, euh, par exemple, je parle de mon expérience avec euh, l'EMA. L'EMA, c'est comme je vous disais, c'est un groupe de femmes intergénérationnelles. La doyenne, elle a 78 ans et la plus jeune, elle a, elle a 20 ans. Et je tiens à préciser, à préciser l'échange entre euh, ces, ces générations au départ c'est pas facile, comme disait euh, mon, les, les, les vieilles, enfin les, les vieilles artistes, elles, a, elles, ont, elles ont peur qu'on qu change cette, cette tradition, 
comprend pas. Il y a des chansons, par exemple, spirituelles et tout, très codifiées, et c'était très, très dur. Il fallait vraiment entamer un dialogue, il fallait entamer un dialogue et une confiance pour qu'on puisse changer les choses. Parce que ces détonatrices de son, ce patrimoine ont, ont vraiment une peur de cette jeune génération, qu'elle prenne ce patrimoine et qu'elle qu le travestisse. Et moi, je ne suis pas d'accord. C'est bien de, de s'inspirer de, de ce patrimoine et euh, que le changement, c'est vrai qu'il si on veut euh, modifier des musiques traditionnelles, il faut faire très, très attention. Il ne faut, faut pas dénaturer cette musique. Mais c'est sûr qu'avec avec, avec, l'âge, avec les années, que les, 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 ces chants vont être... On ne peut pas les garder autant qu'elles. Euh, moi, si je reprends une chanson traditionnelle, je ne peux pas la reprendre autant qu'elle. Je vais la reprendre, mais je vais rajouter des choses de moi des choses nouvelles, mais il y, y a ce souci, je pense qu'il euh, faut dialoguer avec les générations, leur dire merci de nous, de nous apprendre et de nous donner de ce patrimoine, qu'on va le préserver, même si on ajoute des choses, mais avoir cette conscience de préserver ce, 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 ce patrimoine par l'échange. Et je pense que le, l'échange le, intergénérationnel dans la culture est très, très, très important. La confiance est très importante. Est, euh, il, faut aller vers les, il faut aller vers eux, les rassurer, leur dire, nous, on est là, on, on adore cet art et on va en prendre soin. Et euh, pour la deuxième question, est-ce que les médias euh, nous aident Bien sûr, les médias jouent un, un grand, grand, grand rôle. On a besoin d'eux. Euh, je pense que ce qui nous a aidé avec l'EMA, euh, c'est surtout les concerts, c'est surtout de, de pratiquer, de jouer le, le, le plus possible. Et les voyages, c'est surtout d'aller de, de, faire découvrir cette, cette tradition dans d'autres pays. Et c'est ça qui, euh, qui, qui nous a énormément aidé, c'est le travail. Plus, plus on travaille, plus on nous connaît, plus on découvre notre musique, plus euh, on, a, on a envie de, de donner. Et ces deux dernières années n'ont pas été très, très faciles. On avait beaucoup, beaucoup de concerts, mais il y a eu le corona, ça fait trois ans, presque deux ans et demi que je n'ai pas vu euh, euh, le main et j'espère que ça va changer. Ça va. Um, it's a good place for us to end today, actually. Um, and um, yeah, I think social media um, has, has certainly played a big role in the pandemic and giving exposure to um, to music. And um, hopefully next time you'll be here in person, all of you, and performing and showing your work here on campus. Um, thank you very much for your time, for your work, and for the gift of music you've given us all. Um, and I I think that brings us to the end. I think Reem wants to come in and say something. Thank you, everybody. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Alia. Wow, that was really amazing. Thank you, Alia and our panel and our panelists. I'd like to also thank you for staying with us. That was really great. We hope to see you in person again in our upcoming of the stage event in person. I, I remind everyone, uh, Rooftop Rhythms will be at Manara Tel Saadiyat on February 25th. Free tickets will be online this Thursday. You can register for both of, for, for this event uh, on our website. Uh, stay safe, everyone, and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Good luck. Mm-hmm. <laughs>